Hi, this is our fourth video session in the expansion wave topic. In this session, we will look at how to calculate the lift and drag on supersonic aircrafts. At this introductory level, we will only consider objects with simple shapes to illustrate fundamental concepts. The same concepts can then be extended for more complicated shapes, typically using computer programs to handle a large number of computations. What you can see here are some examples of supersonic aircrafts. Arion is a modern business jet with a maximum speed of Mach 1.6. Concorde was a transport aircraft built in the 1960s and flown at maximum speed of Mach 2. Lockheed Martin F-35 is a fighter jet with a maximum speed of Mach 1.6. They all share a few common design characteristics. The most important ones are that their noses are pointed and sharp, their fuselages are sleek and slender, and their wings are relatively smaller and shorter than those of the normal planes, and are located towards the back ends of the aircraft. These characteristics are designed as such to minimize the wave drag due to the shock waves produced during supersonic flights. The overall lift and drag of the aircrafts are also governed by the supersonic flows around them. To illustrate the concept of calculating the lift and drag on supersonic aircrafts, we need to simplify these complex real shapes of the aircrafts into a much simpler one. The common shape used for this purpose is that of a wedge, as shown here. We've learned that when the wedge is immersed inside a supersonic flow, it will produce oblique shocks and expansion fans, depending on whether the flow is deflected inward or outward. Across the oblique shocks and expansion fans around the wedge, the flows change accordingly, and that will directly affect the forces acting on the surfaces around the wedge. These forces can be combined into a single resultant force F acting at the center of the wedge. The force F can then be decomposed into the overall lift L and the overall drag D acting on the entire wedge. Ok, now let's look at this simple symmetrical wedge facing a supersonic flow with a free stream Mach number M1 and a free stream pressure P1. The wedge is inclined at a positive angle of attack alpha to produce positive lift. So how does this positive alpha produce positive lift? The biggest influence comes from the two front surfaces, the upper surface in R2 and the lower surface in R3. Because alpha is positive, we can see that the incoming flow faces a bigger inward deflection at the lower surface. If we increase alpha further, the inward deflection angle gets bigger at the lower surface. But at the upper surface, the inward deflection angle becomes smaller and smaller. Up to a point, it even turns into an outward deflection. In that case, it will produce an expansion fan, not an oblique shock. So, because of this, the lower surface will experience the biggest pressure compared to all the other surfaces. The overall effect is that it pushes the entire wedge upward, which is basically the lift force. At the same time, because of the highest pressure in region 3, the overall effect is to push the entire wedge backward, which is basically the drag force. Now, let's go back to the details of the calculation process. At this point, from our previous sessions, we already know how to calculate all the pressures and Mach numbers on all the four main surfaces of the wedge. We can also get any other flow properties, such as temperature and density, if we need them. The main thing that we need to know to calculate these flow changes is whether the flow is going through an oblique shock or an expansion fan. Once we've identified that, the calculation process is rather straightforward. After the leading edge, as explained just now, we should be able to get M2 and P2 at the upper surface and M3 and P3 at the lower surface. Beyond these front surfaces, both the upper and lower flows will deflect at the top and bottom corners of the wedge. They will undergo the expansion process into regions 4 and 5. At this point, we should be able to get M4 and P4 and M5 and P5. If we follow through the flows further, they will collide with each other behind the trailing edge. 
After the collision, they will then continue to flow in one direction only, but not necessarily at the same speed. The line separating the two regions R6 and R7 is called a slip line. We have looked at the slip line before this, and we know that across the slip line, the pressures on both sides have to match, otherwise the slip line will become unstable. Now, going back to the four main surfaces of the wedge, the pressure on each one of them will act onto the surface with the normal force F equals to P times the area of each surface. So, for this wedge, we can calculate the force vectors F2, F3, F4, and F5. Again, each force is perpendicular to the surface, all acting towards their own surfaces. Now that we know all the force vectors, we can add all these vectors together into a single force acting at the center of the entire wedge. That single force can be decomposed into two forces. One is the overall lift force and another is the overall drag. We will see later how to decompose each one of the individual force vector F and to add them into the overall lift and drag vectors. Coming back to the slip line at the trailing edge, we can calculate the pressures P6 and P7. But because we don't know yet what the slip line angle is, we need to do some kind of iterative calculations. What we know is that their flow directions and pressures need to match across the slip line. Now, here comes the important part. Because P6 and P7 don't act upon any of the surfaces of the wedge, they won't affect the lift and drag calculations. So, it turns out that we don't need to calculate P6 and P7 at all, if all that we want to know is the lift and drag on the wedge. Our next video is in the process of solving problems on the lift and drag of simple objects in supersonic flows.